Well, as you know, we're coming upon the uh, 50th anniversary of the assassination of, of President Kennedy. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your uh, relationship with the Kennedys, your memories of that fateful day and the, uh, the, 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 the ensuing days when your father first took the presidency. We'll start with the Kennedy family. Uh, Lucy, what do you recall about the, uh, your family's relationship with the Kennedy family? Respectful, gracious, listening. Um, my father had a great deal of admiration for President Kennedy and uh, for Mrs. Kennedy, as did my mother. Uh, that was all that was transferred to me. I know I've heard a lot of, of comments by people over the generations about uh, uh, judgment, animosity, uh, estrangement between uh, different members of the Kennedy family or the Johnson family or either of their staffs. As for me personally, uh, none of that was a part of my life. Uh, I never heard my parents say anything except uh, uh, words of respect and empathy. Uh, tremendous amount of, uh, oh, but for the grace of God and personal uh, angst and passionate desire to, to lift the trauma that had befallen that young and beautiful and vibrant family. Uh, and you know, my father's words, oh, I would give all that I have if I weren't standing here today, were written uh, on that speech that he delivered to the people of the United States, but they were emblazoned in his heart. What, what, do you recall your first meeting with President Kennedy? Well, my first meeting with um, Candidate Kennedy took place at um, the Democratic uh, National Convention after uh, Senator Kennedy had defeated Senator Johnson. And um, I had a lot of mixed emotions, obviously. I was a young girl of 13. This was a, a, a traumatizing time. Uh, I went in with my father uh, while President Kennedy was dressing. Uh, I felt awkward about being there at, at, at the time, fearful that um, maybe I ought not to have been somehow, and yet he invited me into uh, uh, his room uh, with my father and did all a human being could do to look me in the eyes, to reach out and give me a hug, to make me feel like this was all going to be all right. We were going to be a team. Uh, he needed my father as I needed my father. And that uh, if I would give him uh, my support and enthusiasm, that would be a gift beyond measure. Now, we all know that my support and my enthusiasm uh, uh, was of little import, but that's not the way he made me feel. And uh, I loved him for that. Uh, and my father uh, made it very clear that that's what he wanted, mm -hmm. that we were a team. And that is, from those moments on, that's what I felt. What do you recall about your father's transition from majority leader in the Senate to vice president of the United States? It was difficult. My father loved the Senate. Uh, all that he has written indicates that that was a golden time in, in his life. Um, the members of the Congress were his family. In fact, years later, when uh, I married for the first time, there was criticism that, that maybe it was a state wedding because we were having so many people from the Congress invited to the, to the wedding. And yet I, we felt like, golly, if we admitted all the people from the Congress, you know, who would we have invited as our friends? <laughs> Those were the people that, uh, 
you, you know, you, um, who understood your journey. Uh, back then, you um, went to school together with their kids. You uh, went to PTA meetings uh, as, as parents, to church as parents, to little league games as parents and children, to, to church and synagogue. Um, it was a very different, it was a very different time. So you might uh, uh, fight with frenzy uh, on the on the on the floor of the uh, Senate or the House, but afterwards you came and and had a drink together or went over to each other's houses and and you put your arms across the table and you tried to, as my father would quote Isaiah, come and reason together and understand that. Each of you were just trying to do the best you could by your convictions and the people you served. Did you get a sense of the evolution of President Johnson, uh, President uh, Kennedy's and, and Vice President Johnson's relationship during the Kennedy administration? Well, I've heard a lot about, you know, it's hard to, to separate sometimes, Mark, uh, history as it was in history in the rearview mirror. I was just um, 16 years old when President Kennedy was assassinated. And I've heard an awful lot about who thought what, when, where, and why afterwards, uh, either from people's conversations or from what I've read or what I've listened to. So uh, I, I recognize that uh, memory can be um, an imperfect servant. But I do believe I have one very uh, strong advantage, and that I was so young and so impressionable and was lifted into a situation that was so beyond uh, any experience that I had ever had that some ways it's sort of synthesized and it's sort of frozen in time maybe in a way for me that it might not be quite so much with people who had more history and, and more experience. Um, I felt my father uh, during the vice presidency was really in a position that was very difficult for him and that, that he was struggling with. Uh, he was in charge in the Senate, and he knew it, <laughs> and he exercised it, and yet he had a great deference to uh, everybody on both sides of the aisle, and he knew that if he took too much charge, uh, he would be less effective. He needed to have that right uh, position of leadership coupled with that right position of respect and deference. In the vice presidency, it's kind of hard to, to, to define your roles. In so many ways, the president defines your roles. And I know that it meant a great deal to my father that uh, President Kennedy deferred to him for leadership in, the, in, in space. I, I know it meant a lot to him that President Kennedy deferred to to him to the degree that he did about the temperament, the climate of, of the Congress that he had been so much a part of. But I know that it was hard for him to be in the position of needing to, um, to wait, to show that deference. Daddy was uh, a student of history first and foremost. And so waiting and showing that deference, being a team member was first and foremost. And sometimes I, I suspect when needing to do that um, was in conflict with what he thought might need to be done at the moment, must have been hard. But uh, I felt like uh, it was about biting your tongue and biting your time. Right. What was your experience like on November 22nd, 1963? Well, I don't think that there's a person alive today 
who doesn't know exactly where he or she was uh, when President Kennedy was shot, or what, better yet, when they were told about the shooting of President Kennedy. And I am no exception. I thought for many years that it was every American. And then I married a man who was British, and I spoke with his family. And I came to realize that this was really a worldwide experience, that the head of the um, leading country of the free world, who was handsome and young and vibrant with a new uh, strength and uh, charisma that had captured the world stage, was all of a sudden wiped off from it in a moment of violence that we really, for at least a, a, a generation, had been, had been spared on a national basis. It, it, it left everybody feeling a sense of personal grave violation. And I am no exception. I know exactly where I was, what I was doing, uh, what I had eaten uh, uh, before uh, I heard. Uh, Talk about every it. moment of it is, is clearer to me than anything about yesterday is. Yeah. You're, you, you were in Washington. Your parents were obviously in Dallas. Your sister was in Austin, Texas. What, how did you learn of uh, the, the attempt on President Kennedy's life? Well, I was in Spanish class. Uh, and a young girl came running into my class, a classmate, saying, the president's been shot, the president's been shot. And other members of the class uh, responded with comments like, you know, don't talk like that in front of Lucy, she's here. And the, and, and the poor girl who had announced it, you know, felt a sense of, you know, gosh, I'm just trying to tell you all what's happened. Uh, and then there was, of course, an immense amount of Twitter and, and, a, and a real sense of... Um, trauma for all of us. And my teacher, who had been on the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, took a commanding role in the class trying to bring us all together and said, this is just conjecture. This is not something that we know. And until we do, girls, there will be Spanish. Now, you can imagine how many of us were prepared to have Spanish. And yet I think she who had been through so much trauma at a very tender age in her life had this fortitude of you will move on. And none of us were prepared to move on. But all of a sudden, the bells of the National Cathedral began to ring and ring and ring and 400 young women, without a word of instruction, got up and marched single file towards the gym which also served as our chapel. And I marched too. And all of a sudden I looked up and I saw two girls breaking line, something that just simply wasn't done in an all-girls school in the 1960s. And it caught my attention until I realized why everyone was moving back so they could move forward. It was because they were my best friends. And there was a keen awareness that they ought to be close to me because my march was going to be a different one. And so we marched down into the gymnasium without a word, sat in our seats, fell to our knees, and were told by the headmistress that President Kennedy had been shot that Governor Conley had been shot, that it was a grave situation, 
that had taken place in Dallas, that they did not know what the outcome would be. All that they knew was the president and Governor Conley needed our prayers. President Kennedy was my president, but, but he was also my father's boss. And he had also become, I felt, my personal friend. Governor Conley uh, was my Uncle Johnny. He had worked for my father, but we had literally lived together in the same house. We had uh, uh, played together, prayed together. Uh, they were family. And nobody ever mentioned my father or my mother. And yet I knew they were there too. I listened. I prayed. I rose from my chair when we were dismissed. I went out into the quadrangle uh, that was next to the gymnasium. I looked up and saw a young man approaching me and heard a young girl saying, man on campus, which uh, I guess was being said because uh, he was young and he was good looking and there weren't many men and it was sort of an announcement to girls who might be leaning over or tending to their underskirt or something that uh, uh, they might not want to be. And I recognized that it was one of my father's Secret Service. The Secret Service had been very thoughtful in sending somebody I knew. And as Jean Nunn approached me, I did all that I could think to do, and that was to run in the opposite direction. Run from him rather than to him, as if by doing so I could avoid hearing what I knew he had to tell me and what I knew I couldn't bear to hear. My running or outrunning the Secret Service obviously was a ludicrous thought. Uh, he caught me, put his arms around me like a big brother and said, I'm sorry, Lucy. I'm so sorry. And I remembered looking up to him and into his eyes and taking my fists and literally knocking his chest and saying, oh, Gene. And I remember him saying, I'm sorry, Lucy. And I said, no, Gene. And he said, I'm sorry, Lucy. And nobody said what no and I'm sorry was all about because it was just unthinkable. It was not, not something you could verbalize. And then I caught my breath and my conscience. And I said, I suppose we have to leave then. And he said, yes. And I looked up at him because there was a question that was in the middle of my throat that I dared not ask, but knew I had to. And said, and Daddy, Mama? And he said, they're okay. As okay as they can be. When did you first make contact with your parents after the shooting? Well. I'd like, if I could, to, to go on with the rest of that story. I um, asked Jean if we needed to go to the headmistress's office because if we were going to leave, that's what we needed to do. And when we did, Jean, of course, told the headmistress. But there was all that time as we walked kind of arm in arm where he knew what I knew and I knew what he knew, but nobody could even say it. Um, we left, got in the car, 
went to what was our home. There wasn't a vice presidential home at the time. And something very significant that I would like to share if I could took place many, many years later. I was taking one of those girls who joined me in the halls to march to the gymnasium, Helen Lindo Gordon, through the library with her two young daughters. And I was sharing this story. And I looked at Helen and I said, Helen, you know, I've often wondered over the years, what happened to you after we were dismissed. Did you go back to class? Were, was the school dismissed? What happened to you? And she looked at me just dumbfounded by my question. Said, oh my God, Lucy, you remember. I never left you. I went with you to Miss Lee's office. I climbed into the car with you. We crouched on the floor because we didn't know if there was some sort of conspiracy, if we could be vulnerable until we got out of the car at your home. And I never left your side until you were in your parents' arms. And all of a sudden, every bit of that came back. And uh, all of these years, with more and more conversation and more and more understanding of post-traumatic stress syndrome, I had thought of that as something that happens to people at war or to their families. I never really looked at it on a personal level in terms of the assassination. But I guess I just had felt so acutely alone, so terribly isolated. Those hours between my learning of the assassination until I was in my parents' arms, that I didn't even remember that my best friend had never, ever left my side. When did you first speak with your, your parents after the assassination had occurred? When they came back to um, Elms. I saw them on TV. I uh, desperately wanted something to do that would be positive. In the southern part of the United States where I had grown up, when somebody dies, one of the first things you do is you go to the kitchen. You start making a pot roast or cookies or something to take to somebody's house. Uh, that obviously wasn't going to be a useful activity on, on my part. And so I thought, what can I do? And I recognized that um, I went to an all-girls school. My hair wasn't clean. Didn't feel much initiative to do so during the week sometimes. And uh, so I went and washed my hair. It somehow felt irreverent. It somehow felt uh, the wrong thing to do. And, and yet, I knew it, it would need to be done. And in the days to come, there might not be the time. I stayed glued to the television set, to live news, uh, which was not um, as much a part of our daily existence as it is today. With, on a 24-hour news cycle, uh, we're bombarded with 
uh, what is the news of the moment and a lot of rehashing of it all day long, but that wasn't within my experience. News was something that happened in the morning. News was something that happened at six o'clock at night. News was something that happened uh, at uh, 11 o'clock. News wasn't in your face all day long, but that day it was. And so I, I like Americans across the country, went to the man that everybody said we trusted most, Walter Gronkite. And I sat and I watched and I cried and I said, how could it be? It can't be true. It can't be true. It can't be true. As I began to digest, of course, it was. So you saw your father's first remarks to the nation, which he made at Andrews Air Force Base, and then shortly thereafter, I take it, they returned home? Yes, and, and the yeah. irony of it is, the great irony of it is, um, I went to the Secret Service immediately and said, I want to go. I need to be at Andrews. I need to be standing there to greet my parents. And it was the first of many times that the Secret Service would take charge of my life. And they said, no, Lucy. We simply cannot take on any ex more exposure of your family to the public eye than we have to. You're here, you're safe, your parents know that. And for you to leave would only potentially add to their angst. And therefore, we're saying no. Not we're asking you no. But clearly, they were telling you no. And that was the kind of relationship we had. Uh, it was one of my asking, their denying or accepting the object of my inquiry for the next five years. What, do you remember what your parents said to you when they returned, when you were reunited after that day? Just hugs, just the same words that Jean Nunn and I have had for each other. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And no, no. And then the sense that we will move on. We'll move on together. We just hope you understand that our lives will not be our own. And they weren't ever again. What were those next couple days like? What do you recall about the ensuing days after that tragic day? My parents never seemed to sleep. There was always a, 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 a thundering herd of folks through the house. There were lots of these are what we will do, being shared. I remember years later reading Jack Valenny's book about the night after the assassination when there uh, was so much conversation about how we needed to move on how the president may have been killed, but how we couldn't let his dreams die with him. How our country would move on, 
because that was the right thing to do by his convictions and the right thing to do by our convictions. And I can remember looking out my door before I went to bed that night of November 22nd and seeing the light on and hearing voices. And I can remember getting up in the middle of the night because it was a sleepless night for the world and seeing the light on and hearing the voices. And I can remember doing that sort of time and time again and then falling, finally falling into sleep and uh, getting up with daybreak. So I wasn't there listening to what was taking place, but I surely am there to confirm that there was a very vigilant voice of planning and commitment going on in the room next door to me. Uh, afterwards, I was present for all of the funeral commitments. I marched to St. Matthew's Cathedral behind my parents. I was in the process of personally converting to Catholicism. And so I felt a special comfort in being in that church. I watched that unbelievably strong and beautiful First Lady hold the hands of her children with grace and stature. I never saw anybody look more alone in my life, and yet she was surrounded by such a, a large and vibrant family. My heart broke, as did our nations, when they saw that little boy salute his father's casket. I went home to a sense of emptiness because I had no role to fulfill anymore, and yet my parents had no time to call their own. Somehow I was expected to go back to school and expected to go back to learn. That was my job, and yet I felt consumed with the angst of it all. There was no um, psychological grieving counseling that you see go on so much today in institutions who are met by this kind of trauma. I, uh, I remember the first argument I think I ever heard my parents have witnessing it. I heard my parents' voices raised at each other, which was just not something I'd been exposed to. And yet I lived right across the hall from them. Uh, I confess, uh, <laughs> I did what I probably had no business doing. I, I was called by their raised voices and I, I walked out into the hallway and I stood there and, and listened to a conversation that should have been thoroughly private. 
but wasn't. <laughs> and I heard my mother say to my father, Lyndon, I just simply can't move on that day. And my father sang, Bird, I know, I understand, but December 7th is the day that works for the Secret Service. It works for Mrs. Kennedy. It's the day we have to move into the White House. And my mother sang, Lyndon, any day but that, absolutely any day. And my father sang, Bird, I don't want to deny you anything in this life. You've been my life's partner. You're my best friend. I understand where you're coming from, but these are not our decisions. It works for Mrs. Kennedy. It works for the Secret Service. It's what we have to do. And my mother, seeming to take a deep breath, couldn't see her, could only hear the pregnant pauses and saying, you're right, we'll do what we have to do. What was her resistance to that day? Well, I was a young girl of 16. I hadn't taken American history. I hadn't taken world history. I didn't realize that that was her 911. December 7th, of course, was a day that um, lived in infamy, really for all time, but especially for her generation because it was the anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I couldn't understand what was a hang-up mother about a particular date, and yet for them to start their journey as uh, the 36th President of the United States and his First Lady on the day that was so filled with scars for them to Add to the scar of the assassination, the scar of the memory of World War II. Just, I could imagine in retrospect how onerous that felt for Mother. And I can see in retrospect my father's courage in recognizing that it was, was not a decision to make about our personal preferences. It was a decision about what was the right thing to do by the widow of our slain president and by the security of our country. And it became acutely apparent that uh, a lot of the decisions in the days to come would be made by what we had to do and needed to do more than what our personal preferences were. We moved into the White House on December 7th, 1963. And that night was sort of the first moment of life was going to go on, and there would be personal time and personal space for us. My parents took a break from the incessant meetings that they were a part of from dawn until midnight to go to the comfort of a close friend's home and have dinner. Now, the close friend's home that they chose was a staff member, and I have no doubt that they probably worked throughout the meal. But at least they were in the privacy of a loved one's space and off the public stage, if but for a moment. And I was in my room at the White House, which was far different than any room I'd ever slept in. I had a fireplace. And all of a sudden, instead of feeling the burden of the previous couple of weeks, I began to feel a little bit of the fancy of the future. 
I asked my girlfriend who had come to spend the night. Her name was Beth Jenkins. She was the daughter of Walter Jenkins, where my parents were. If she knew anything about fireplace flues. And I am convinced that she comforted me into thinking that she did. Possibly I just comforted myself. <laughs> but the bottom line is I lit the fire. And in a matter of moments, I felt no comfort at all because the room was enveloping in smoke. And I recognized that I could be in a desperate situation. And I didn't know even how to get to the bathroom, uh, yet how to put the fire out after I got the only source of water that was close. So I sort of blindly felt my way to the bathroom door, found a juice glass, went and tried to put it out, recognized that that was uh, going to be far too lengthy a, a, a process. Uh, went back into the bathroom with a trash can that I'd found, managed to uh, fill the trash can with water and douse the fire out uh, in a, a great sense of, of, of stress and panic mode. Uh, climbed up on the top of my desk to open what were, I guess, six foot, eight foot ceilings and uh, uh, windows rather in my, in my bathroom, only to have my breath totally taken away by the fact that a White House policeman was directly underneath me. And I was a 16-year-old girl in a nightgown. The trauma of having my personal space so painfully invaded and recognized with obvious horror and judgment by the policeman below left my heart racing. The thought that my contribution to history might be that I'd burned the place down the first night <laughs> was pretty uh, overwhelming. Uh, I spent that first week in the White House, which you might think would have some sense of excitement with some sense of trauma and that uh, it was my responsibility to help uh, clean the smoke off of the walls, paint over the mistakes that I had made. It was a great lesson for me that first week to recognize the repercussions of my own actions could indeed have a public imprint, not just on my life, but on my family's life, but on the country's life. In retrospect, I think it probably was uh, a very helpful experience, traumatic as it was, to introducing me to life in the White House as a teenager. Because on that very first night, I came to appreciate that I was just a part of a team. My mother came to referring to the White House sometimes as the uh, uh, public housing, the best public housing in the world, but indeed still just that. And we were simply visitors, and we better make sure that our time there was a credit to the privilege. Did you see a change palpably in your father as he took on the burdens of the presidency? Oh, you could just feel the weight on his shoulder. Uh, but uh, there was never a moment of why me. Uh, he never uh, could afford to do that. And I think most of us, when we go through some sort of trauma, need to go through that passage of why me. But Daddy knew, knew that the country needed. No, it 
demanded his leadership at the highest level he could muster. And he made it abundantly clear to all of us, not just those first days, but really all the days of the next five years, that he knew our tenure there would be a very short time. And there really could be no wasted moments, very few private moments. And in those first few weeks, no moments really much at all to call your own. Those first two weeks, the entire White House was draped in black uh, because there was a month of uh, mourning. And so you walked through the halls with your voice low, your head sort of bowed. You tried to be a shadow, a part of the backdrop. You knew that there was so much more important activity taking place. You didn't dare to have a personal question to either of your parents. You, and my sister went back to school and Texas, I was pretty much on my own. Um, my father was working nonstop on the first of many commitments to President Kennedy's agenda, a tax bill. And uh, it was going to take his every breathing moment before Christmas. But after the month of mourning was over, on my mother's birthday, December 22nd, out came Christmas. We had a tree. We lit it. The country was going to survive for tomorrow and we were going to be a part of it. And so, in the midst of all of this uh, dawn to midnight fervor over getting the tax bill out, there were still twinkling lights and a sense of life would go on. My hope was the selfish hope of an adolescent. Are we going to make it home for Christmas? My daddy's focus was, are we going to get a tax bill? And we'll get it before Christmas, or there won't be any going home for any of us. December 24th, all of a sudden, it was packing your bag time, and we were headed for the ranch. And the comfort of some sense of normalcy, whatever that was that I could ever capture again. I'd grown up half a year in Texas, half a year in Washington, all of my life. I'd had a bizarre <laughs> educational experience, uh, no year in any one place ever, no continuity of curriculum, uh, living in multiple houses, my parents couldn't afford to uh, just lock the door. We always had to rent the house out. And so no sense of your space staying your own. You had to take that space with you or else it was going to become somebody else's. But when we got to the ranch, there were memories of other Christmases, other Thanksgivings, other birthdays a sense that this was one place we really could call home. Because there was conflict about the White House. It was home, and yet it was the people's house. I'd learned the lesson of lighting the fireplace, 
that I was just a tenant here. And uh, it was a great lesson to learn because as a tenant, I had a tenant's responsibilities to live by the rules. And the bottom line, I had been a teenager uh, with a driver's license. Uh, all of a sudden, that driver's license was just the chance to operate a motor vehicle, not to say where it would go. Mm. Lucy, what is your most enduring memory of John F. Kennedy? A very private moment. That moment at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles, California, when a young, vibrant candidate for the president took time off to let a young girl know that her feelings mattered. And he wanted me to be a part of a great team. A lot of people will say their most enduring moment may be of that funeral cortege and of that little boy saluting his daddy. Well, it's seared in my heart forever too. But I choose to remember most the optimism of the Kennedy administration, the inclusiveness and the caring that was shown to me that day when he simply reached out and said, welcome aboard. Because I think as I look back on that day when President Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were sworn in as president and vice president, that they really asked a nation to come. Let's forge a new frontier together. And I choose to remember that he asked me to. Lucy, thank you very much.